thank you, Glenn. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here in Sydney today. Um, whenever, I, whenever I land in a, in a new country, I always check out the local um, Bitcoin scene. And so I was at the meetup group yesterday with some of the, the Bitcoiners. Um, and it's remarkable to see how the audience has changed so much over the last six years. Um, and uh, since I've been doing that. And uh, today, I, I guess, many people would have come to this topic um, knowing the word blockchain before they even knew the word Bitcoin. Um, well, I'd like to give the alternative perspective of someone that came at this from Bitcoin um, and was very disinterested in blockchain. Um, but found the most interesting thing about Bitcoin was watching the journey of creating the largest supercomputer in the world that was audited by hundreds of thousands of computers all around the world and has created uh, the, a supercomputer that is unparalleled in terms of its size and scale and security. Um, and that's what really interested me um, in Bitcoin. And, the technology behind it was open source technology that people have copied thousands of times. Um, and it was really quite disinteresting um, back then. But now the, the word blockchain has become the thing that everyone's interested in. So what I'd like to do is share a bit of that journey from, it was probably this month, about six years ago, um, that a, a gentleman called Jonathan um, messaged me on Facebook. Uh, because he was telling me how he had sold everything that he had owned, including his house um, and all of his goods, and invested it in this, uh, this crazy thing called Bitcoin. Um, and uh, he sent me over some Bitcoin and gave me a link to download a Bitcoin wallet. Because uh, prior to this, I wrote a book called Bank to the Future. Um, and in that book, there was uh, the first draft of the book, there was no Bitcoin and there was no words such as fintech. And it was purely focused on systemic risk in banking and top down reforms that the governments are going to need to implement um, in order to drive some kind of sustainability in banking. Um, but when I received this uh, Bitcoin, it triggered off an interest. Um, and I wondered why he had gone so crazy to sell all of his worldwide possessions in his house and everything he owns um, to just hold the single Bitcoin. In fact, he made himself homeless. Um, and he, start, he moved into a squat in London, in Old Street. And he was squatting with some, one of the original developers um, that was behind um, coding the original implementation of Bitcoin. Um, and uh, after that, uh, I, I went down this rabbit hole, so to speak, um, and uh, looked at it purely from an economic standpoint as an investment, as an alternative to bank deposits and a store of value, as opposed to a currency or some of the, the blockchain applications that we see today. Um, and uh, what, what uh, stroke, stroke me is that I was invited to the first Bitcoin conference in the world in Prague at that point. Um, and when I spoke, I was coming from the perspective of, you know, an ex-investment banker, wrote, wrote the book on, on the future of finance, um, and found this new thing called Bitcoin and decided to include it in the second draft of the book. Um, and what I discovered was that there were three things that I identified in the book that Bitcoin solved in its own economy. Um, and this led me to, um, and I'd like to share the stories of how that's evolved to where we are today. And then I'd like to end with some forecasts of what I think is going to happen over the next five years and how it's going to play out. Um, so the original thing that got me interested is that I identified three problems that I, I believe needed to be solved in banking um, that will lead to systemic risk in the system. And the first was that when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank is at that point the legal owner of your deposit. It's no longer your deposit. Legally, the bank is completely entitled to that money, and it's theirs. It's no longer yours. Um, people in Cyprus discovered that in 2013, of what happens when the bank exercises its legal entitlement to your deposit. Um, so Bitcoin was really interesting to me because when I understood what was under the rails, 
is it was actually one of the only asset classes that you could transfer over the internet that you could own. And by own, I mean there's only a few asset classes that you can own. Cash, gold, depending on what format it's in, um, and then Bitcoin came along, and other asset classes like fine art and various other things that the, the rich and wealthy invest in uh, to try and own their own assets. And so that was kind of the first observation. With bank deposits, the bank owns your money. With Bitcoin, you own your money. The second observation was that while banks actually own your deposit, when you deposit it with them, um, they also spend it as they wish. And so they created a systemic risk because banks' favorite asset class became property. And so almost all bank deposits and all the, the leverage they can do with that is over a vast majority of it, over 40% of it, is guided into the property market, which on top of the economics of supply and demand is what creates ever-increasing property prices to the point where no one can afford it anymore, when their wages are decreasing at a higher rate than property prices are increasing. Um, and uh, that's going to create some kind of systemic risk. Um, and uh, the difference with Bitcoin was that it was actually a peer-to-peer -peer network. So while what came with your own, the ability to own your own money came the ability to transfer it any way, any way and any way you want in a fully censorship-resistant way where you can actually send it to anyone else that's connected to the internet. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it kind of, in its own economy, addressed that factor. But the third factor that got me really interested, um, and the bit that I found a little bit hard to understand, was the monetary policy. So the monetary policy that I was talking about um, with the banking system is that essentially, um, over the decades, um, banks invented digital currency through bank licenses. When they were granted bank licenses, they were given a privilege whereby they could create a new digital deposit, a digital version of the government's currency. And the way they create it was as they issue a loan. And so when you issue a loan, they simultaneously create an asset and a liability. And that asset is a positive balance on someone's online banking, which is always met by somebody else's negative balance on their online banking. So the, diff the digital currency that banks invented that was granted to them through the ability to have a banking license was the ability to actually create money when they issue a loan. And over time, this digital currency um, was implemented into every, every country and it became more important than the government's currency, the, the currency that the government creates, which is cash and coins. And in fact, it became insignificant compared to central bank money. Um, and so um, the monetary policy of traditional digital currencies, um, which were created by banks, are that in order to have a, a, an economy growing, you have to have ever-increasing levels of loans. And so you always need to find new markets for your loans, whether that's government debt, central banks taking on um, assets that, that you, where you were lending when you, could, when you couldn't because you needed to find a new market for the debt. And uh, then central banks use interest rates in order to control how much money is being created by the private banks through the digital currency. Um, and there's a whole load of regulations around that. So Bitcoin decided to create a very different monetary policy. And the monetary policy stated that everything is enforced by mass and code. The supply is fixed. Every four years, there will be new Bitcoins that enter this economy. Um, sorry, every 10 minutes there will be new Bitcoins that enter this economy and the number that are created every 10 minutes will half every four years. Really strange concept and by 2140 all 21 million of them will be created and because there's a fixed supply he forecasted that this would be a deflationary currency and therefore if everything goes the way it was meant to go the price will continually go up with volatility in the middle over time. Um, as long as there's a, there's a market for those Bitcoins. Now, originally, when I first heard of this, that monetary policy sounded like a Ponzi scheme to me. It sounded like you needed ever-increasing new um, demand for the new Bitcoins that would be created, and then the value might go up, and if the value goes up and there's a new buying supply, then you might be able to give returns to the old investors. It wasn't quite a Ponzi scheme, but it sounded very much like it. Um, next thing that happened is uh, the, this, this, uh, this thing that at the time had no value started to actually 
a creator value. So just to summarize those three things, with uh, banks, it's a, they own your money, they spend your money, and all the monetary policy is created by debt and it's inflationary and it increases over time, so your purchasing power decreases over time. With Bitcoin, it's the exact opposite. You own your money, you spend it peer to peer, and uh, the purchasing power is a deflationary currency whereby the, if you're saving them, it encourages savings because the value is meant to go up over time. Um, and so they, these two contrasting forces. Um, then all of a sudden, price discovery came to Bitcoin. I remember the first price for Bitcoin, uh, for those historians here that were around, um, was 10,000 Bitcoins equals two pizzas. Because uh, someone persuaded Papa John's Pizza to accept what today is worth uh, $10 million um, for two pizzas. And uh, that was the first price discovery. Then a gentleman called Mark Capellus came along um, who moved from France um, to Japan and created this uh, company that you probably all heard of called Mt. Gox. And uh, what Mt. Gox did is it stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange and it was a piece of technology that he purchased that was just designed for children and uh, hobbyists to exchange magic cards online. Um, and he decided to pivot his business model and create the first price discovery for Bitcoin by creating a US dollar to Bitcoin exchange. Um, it was built with completely inferior technology, um, technology that was never designed to transact billions of dollars, um, but nonetheless, that was the, the roots of how Bitcoin got its first price. It was a wild ride. Um, at the time, it was just hobbyists, geeks, activists uh, that were interested. But suddenly, a load of volume came into this exchange and uh, people didn't really know where it came from. And then Bitcoin transitioned from what could be a Ponzi scheme to its first user case. I mean, its first user case is a, is a little bit dark and that's why Bitcoin's history is a little bit dark. And that's why banks had to create this new word that they took from the white paper and stopped using Bitcoin and used blockchain instead uh, because of this history. And that was that people would go into Mt. Gox and uh, they needed a, a, a currency that they could purchase um, drugs online. Um, and that was the first chunk of liquidity into the blockchain market. Um, people needed a way to transact, to be able to buy drugs online. This marketplace called Silk Road uh, started taking drugs and gang, gang crime off the streets and put it online in what became a very efficient marketplace where if you were selling poison to people, you got a really bad rating. If you were selling a high quality product, you got a very high rating. Um, and uh, if, you, if you didn't deliver, then your rating would be, would be bad. Um, and instead of having to go meet someone that might potentially mug you, um, attack you, or shoot you, um, you could just purchase online to feed that habit. Um, and this market started transacting billions. Um, and so the first user case came along where people needed to buy Bitcoin and that created tremendous buy volume and the first spike in the price. Um, then I remember it was this time when I went to this conference in, in Prague, um, which was the first Bitcoin conference, and a gentleman called Tony Gallippi was pitching a company called BitPay that we invested in. Um, and BitPay was essentially trying to take the Bitcoin market and they created the sell pressure in the market. Because what they did is they took businesses that wanted to accept Bitcoin as a payment method, um, they allowed anyone to spend their Bitcoins with a, a normal business, put them through a KYC process, a normal um, process and compliance process, um, and then the Bitcoins would be sold for a traditional currency. The merchant didn't care because they were receiving a traditional currency, they didn't need to take on the volatility risk. Um, and that started creating sell pressure. So then we had this marketplace where people had to buy Bitcoin because they could not use any other currency to purchase what was not being supported by merchant processors for obvious reasons. Um, and then sell pressure from uh, legitimate businesses that wanted to accept this new currency as a payment method but receive US dollars. Um, and this marketplace continues. Um, and uh, we started to create this, this very volatile market at this point. Um, at this point, I started to, to get interested in, in two markets. 
and started investing very aggressively in these areas. The markets that, um, that I thought Bitcoin was going to make a difference was, firstly, um, those, those areas where uh, merchant processing just doesn't exist. And that comes to two things. The illegal markets, which wasn't things that I was investing in, um, but the underserved, the financial inclusion markets. And so we started investing in the largest exchanges in India that were providing Bitcoin liquidity in India, um, Africa with BitPaysa, you know, Coin was in India, Bitso in, um, in Mexico, um, BitSpark, which was doing stuff in Indonesia and Philippines, and all the large um, remittance markets that I thought in the future it might make a difference. Um, and the other user case was that now that Bitcoin had a non-speculative user case, um, the algorithm and the design of its commodity-like features of a fixed money supply might actually become an incredible store of value. I didn't know at this point whether it would, but it looked like it was shaping up to be a very interesting store of value. Uh, to give you an idea of where it is today, um, six of the last seven years, Bitcoin has been the highest performing currency in the world. Six of the last seven years. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of, so then something interesting came along. Uh, volume started to really, really increase. We had the sell volume, we had the buy volume. Um, and uh, suddenly, at Mount, uh, I remember it was uh, China um, on their national television. And their national television is uh, a television channel whereby they do not release on that channel unless the government has a specific reason to release something on that channel. They released six documentaries on Bitcoin, um, not painting it as a, a, a currency for drug and crime and all this stuff. Um, and suddenly there was a ginormous speculative wave uh, where the Chinese market started uh, joining in the Bitcoin market and the next user case came along. So we had people that were buying it for merchant processing. Uh, we had people that were selling it because they wanted to receive a traditional currency in a PayPal-like way. Um, and then you had speculators that were coming along and uh, driving the price up or down or shorting and, and various other factors. Um, at this point, uh, it created a tremendous amount of volume in Mt. Gox that they couldn't handle. Uh, Mt. Gox got hacked at this point. Um, and Mt. Gox started to engage in equivalent of fractional reserve banking where it was trying to trade its way out of a Ponzi scheme that it found itself in because it didn't have the deposits to match the liabilities. Um, and uh, eventually uh, they, they, it ran away with the money um, and took about $450 million out of the market um, in what held Bitcoin back for approximately three to four years and still to this day new people new to the blockchain sector that they think that the CEO of Mt. Gox of, is the CEO of Bitcoin and has gone to prison. Um, and Bitcoin has been hacked when it was actually Mt. Gox that was hacked. Um, so then people come to these perceptions uh, there. But then something really interesting happened. Um, venture capitalists started investing in the market. And they started investing in Bitcoin as a currency and all the services around it. So they started investing in companies like Coinbase, BitPay, Blockchain.info, um, and various other the companies. Now, for about a year, they invested about a billion dollars in the sector. Um, and the venture capitalists were very disappointed with the growth because they were investing in Bitcoin as a currency. And they wanted Bitcoin, the currency, to get mainstream adoption. And so they didn't know what next to do. Uh, so in order to try and push their investments, they started speaking with the banks and they started talking with banks about Bitcoin. But they had to approach it with a different word. So they took the word out of Satoshi Nakamoto's paper and said the word blockchain instead of Bitcoin. And uh, many people, many of the banks were skeptical about it um, and they wrote very many damning things about Bitcoin. You've got to be careful about it. You know, be careful and, and all the warnings uh, that came along. But then one bank came along and said, We'll take this blockchain concept and we think it can actually change the way that we do our back office systems and our payment processing. Now, um, at this point, a load of other banks defensively came along and said, hold on, what is this blockchain thing? Um, we don't want that bank to own the whole blockchain and we have to connect into the rails of their bank. We want to own the blockchain thing. And so what they did is they took Bitcoin and they took all the properties 
that make, the, that make their blockchain secure. They took them all out and said, could we centralize this into our operations and systems um, and create something that they were calling a blockchain, but eventually, after about two years of looking at it, was actually a database. And database that had technology that already existed that could do things a lot better. But the word blockchain became the word to get everyone interested. Um, so in 2014, uh, the bank started waving the, the flag of uh, the blockchain. Now, all of a sudden, volume in Bitcoin went through the roof because there was only one blockchain that was working, and that was Bitcoin. And there was only one that had the mining network behind it. There was only one that was secure. There was only one that had the proof of work and global supercomputer um, around it. But uh, the banks were looking to take that out. Um, and take the supercomputer out of it and try and use the technology um, to make sh their systems more efficient. Then suddenly the bank started all telling the fund managers about it and the buy side started looking at how they could um, use this blockchain technology. Um, and then all the financial institutions started figuring out um, how they could use blockchain to disintermediate each other. And so what, what, what what we're seeing, which I think is really interesting right now, is that um, the original user case of blockchain was that it was defined very specifically by Satoshi Nakamoto in his white paper. And it talked about a very specific technological structure um, that is how Bitcoin actually works. And it relies on this concept called proof of work, where um, you have this token, this bearer asset, that people are incentivized to try and burn electricity and invest. Um, and when they burn electricity and invest, they're rewarded with this newly created bearer asset that they own, that they can spend as they wish. And the monetary policy um, determines that it is likely to go up over time as long as the user cases come through. Um, and that is the definition of a blockchain. Now, over time, that definition has completely changed and it's got very confusing. Now um, blockchain is used to describe anything that is essentially a database. But the thing with the blockchain is a blockchain has very clunky, um, expensive um, and challenges in that everybody needs to secure their own private asset. Um, and if you get hacked, not that Bitcoin gets hacked or the blockchain gets hacked, but if you get hacked, um, then you create bearer assets and yet regulations and compliance have made sure that everything's registered. Um, so what's happened now is the only reason, in my opinion, to use a blockchain is if you want to disintermediate someone out of the equation and you want a peer-to-peer -peer network that doesn't have the centralized authority in the middle. And that's when a blockchain becomes worth it. So if two fund managers want to disintermediate this, the investment bank and they want to create a swap, um, you know, they want to swap exposure to a different currency or a different asset class, um, then they could use some kind of smart contracting system and a bearer asset that they can transfer between each other on an unregistered um, um, ledger. And then you've got the blockchain set up that might actually work and is worth the pain, the clunkiness, and the horribleness of the blockchain technology, which often exists, um, like we see with Bitcoin, which is an essential when you want to disintermediate or do something in a decentralized way. However, if you don't want to disintermediate and you don't want to do it in a decentralized way and you just want to connect a load of parties together, um, speak to any technology provider and they'll give you 15 technologies that are much better than blockchain to achieve the same thing. And it won't have the same clunkiness and it'll be, it'll be custom built for the process. Um, so what I want people to kind of be taken away, take away with this is that blockchain is simply, in my opinion, about disintermediation. And if it doesn't follow the definition of what Satoshi Nakamoto defined, proof of work um, and a bearer asset, then it's no longer a blockchain and we're talking about a completely different subject. And when we're talking about this completely different subject called databases that everyone's become interested in, you'll actually find that there's different technology that's got nothing to do with blockchains that will actually achieve the same result of a bunch of people downloading a node and having a shared server um, and achieving a similar result, but it won't have all the expense and challenges. Um, and so what we're seeing right now is approximately 200 
proof of concepts of every single sector determining, let's take a problem and shoehorn a blockchain in. And what I'm seeing is, as someone that runs um, Bank to the Future, the online investment platform, we're getting all those business plans. And when we question why do they need a blockchain in that process, very often um, they realize, actually, we use the word blockchain because that was the only way we could get funded because banks and institutions all around the world are interested in blockchains. Um, and that was the only word we had to use to get funded. Actually, there's different technologies. So you're seeing all the companies pivot away from blockchains, but I think it's going to take about two to three years for this whole process to roll out and realize that the, the technology performs a different role. There will be genuine user cases that involve disintermediation um, where it will be worth that process. Um, but I don't believe that uh, the proof of work, the largest supercomputer in the world that was created with Bitcoin will ever be created again. Um, it's almost like trying to recreate the internet. It was, it, it was the only reason that Bitcoin became the largest supercomputer in the world is because it had five years where no one gave a damn in order to actually grow and scale. Um, and then when it had value, all the hackers started bug testing it, um, but it had a critical mass at that point where you could no longer hack over 50% of the computers. And so Bitcoin's story is 100% unique. And the only reason it got through and the only reason it created this incredible largest supercomputer in the world was because the founder, no one knows who they are. When the founder is known, you have real challenges in creating these blockchains. When it's done under a corporate structure, you have real challenges in creating these blockchains. Um, so it's the model and it's a specific case that came through that I believe is going to change many, many things. And that's what the, the kind of the thought that I'd love to leave people with um, as they get excited about this, uh, this technology. Also saying that, there's nothing wrong with the fact that people are now interested in databases because now they can do great things with databases that they just weren't interested in before. But I don't think it should be called a blockchain because uh, it doesn't perform the functions of what the original definition of a blockchain was. Um, so in terms of forecast of where, where it happens next, well, Bitcoin has now returned to um, record highs. And the only reason it is at record highs right now is because the, invest the banks told the world about blockchain. And every fund manager that I've been, I've sat down with about 100 fund managers in Tokyo, New York, um, Boston, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, all around the world to discuss how they're investing in this technology. And they all came to the conclusion is that we'd love to invest in the economics behind Bitcoin as a store of value, um, but we don't know how we can do that in a compliant way. Uh, so they all go home and they all buy on their own account and everyone's owning their own assets and Bitcoin volume's going up and up and up. And the banks are telling everyone about blockchain, the blockchain telling the fund managers, the fund managers are saying, what is this thing? And they're going home and buying Bitcoin. Um, and now they're looking for a way to take a big chunk of their institutional money and a compliant wrapper in order to invest in Bitcoin as a store of value. So now what we're at is, um, for the first time in history now, um, the regulated structures like ETFs are coming through which essentially is taking a zero counterparty risk currency or commodity or store of value or protocol or technology or whatever you want to call it and they're wrapping it up in counterparty risk for regulatory reasons. So we've got a, currency, we've got a technology that for consumer protection requires anonymity, for security requires anonymity and to, for the integrity of the network requires zero counterparty risk, which was the invention of the blockchain, taking out counterparty risk. Um, and they're putting it all into a, a, a counterparty risk, ETF, because they need to for compliant reasons. So now we have this regulatory challenge where traditional regulations are coming at the expense of consumer protection in order to meet the standard of trying to shoehorn it into the old traditional finance world, creating a less secure asset called an ETF of Bitcoin, where someone's gonna to have to figure out how, who's gonna store those private keys, um, who's gonna do that. But when the ETF does come through, 
Um, we're going to have a race, I believe, from pension fund managers all around the world and fund managers all around the world to purchase the ETF and then the ETF has to be backed by Bitcoin and then that takes Bitcoins out of circulation um, and then that has ever increasing prices where we're now going to have a, right, a race for the cheap Bitcoins. And now Bitcoin has completely achieved the goal that I thought it would never achieve when I first came across it as becoming a global store of value um, where it's the only supercomputer and database audited by hundreds of thousands of computers all around the world where you can fully trust the integrity of the data. Um, now, those kind of structures and centralized databases can be repeated in a trust network, but it's not a blockchain is the important thing there. So then the final thought that I'd love to leave with before, if we've got time for questions or whether I've got to get chucked off at this point, is what happened next at the central banking level. So banks told everyone about blockchains, fund managers started looking at blockchains, and then central banks all started looking at blockchains. And so what central banks did is they heard this thing called a digital currency. Um, and what they saw, I believe, was an opportunity to rage war on cash. And so all central banks and all governments around the world want cash out of the equation. They want everything through a bank. They want a fully digital currency. However, in order to take tash, cash out of the equation, the central bank is losing their income, their scenerage income, um, from creating cash and coins. Now remember, cash and coins are debt-free money. They're created by a central bank. If you take a, a £10 note using the UK as an example, it costs 3 Peter to create and print, and there's a £9.97 profit margin when you sell it to an ATM um, at the bank, and that, bank, that money is transferred debt-free. Um, so you've got the debt-free money supply, which makes up the cash and coins, but the problem is, is that money supply is being called criminal money now, uh, because they think anyone that uses cash is a criminal. Um, you're doing it for tax evasion and money laundering. So they want to get rid of that supply, but it takes away the government's scenerage income. So they have to replace their scenerage income with something else. So is anyone, have we got any Canadians in the room today? Um, if you go home as a Canadian and enter your Canadian, um, you download on the store, the app store, uh, the CadCoin app, and you enter your national security number and your bank clearing um, the equivalent in Canada, you can exchange your Canadian dollars for Canadian coins. And this Canadian coin is issued by a central bank. And what it essentially does is you, when you enter your number, your, your bank details, you eliminate money supply from the banking system that was created by debt through their digital currency and exchange it for central bank currency that was created by the central bank but not backed by debt. So there's two things that uh, central bankers gain from this whole thing of this new interest of digital currencies. And by the way, these digital currencies do not have blockchains. You don't need a blockchain to achieve that. It's a centralized database owned by a central bank. You can call it a digital currency, but it's not a blockchain. The reason that they're not using blockchains is for two reasons. If they wanted transparency, they would already do transparency. You don't need a blockchain to achieve transparency. Um, I mean, you get integrity of data, because, but the reason that central banks don't publish all that data um, is because they never wanted transparency in the first place. Otherwise, they would have achieved it. And that's what comes with a blockchain, open transparency. Um, the second thing is they don't want to give up their scenerage income, as we already discussed. It's an income stream that's given to Treasury and reduces the amount of tax a country has to pay. Um, so digital currency comes along. Don't need a blockchain in order to do it. But um, if a bank goes bust, I don't believe that they no longer need the bailout anymore. They've got two options. You can either do the bail-in and get the consumers to pay, and they lose their deposit and then realize, drive more people to Bitcoin, as more people realize when you deposit your money with the bank, the bank is the legal owner of your money. Or they can allow the bank to go bust and simply allow them to exchange the reserve, the, their bank deposits for digital currency that was created by the central bank on the wallet. They can then use the money that they eliminated from the banking system to re-collateralize their, their toxic assets, whatever they want to do, or they can eliminate it from the money supply. And essentially, you're going to have central banks raging wars on banks. So now the end picture of this whole game is you've got central banks and gov governments that want to rage war on cash. 
You've got banking systems which are fragile and, and are no longer an appetite to bail out. So then the central bank can come along and they can achieve that through a digital currency that doesn't need a blockchain. But the problem with everyone having money in this digital currency um, is that that allows the authority for people to switch off your account um, when they don't like how you're spending your money and automate tax collection. So in the UK, I just received a letter. Um, I'm from Hong Kong, but the U my UK bank sent me a letter which said, um, we've just implemented legislation and now Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, if chooses, um, if they believe you owe money, we can take it direct from your account without due process. And you have to go to court and prove that you don't own the money. So they've reversed the whole due process rather than them having to take you to court um, to prove that you owe the money. And they also um, have implemented new laws that allow for bail-ins a lot easier um, to make that process, to make it clearer that you don't own your deposit. <coughs> um, and the other thing that they've done is that they said the, if HMRC is investigating and going into your account, uh, then they no longer, the bank doesn't need to tell you or ask your permission anymore. Um, these laws are going to be implemented all around the world. So because of the government's appetite to rage war on cash, as we saw in India, confiscation of a ginormous percentage of savers' um, money, whereby they eliminated the largest um, rupee notes from the, the circulation, gave people about 60 days where they could only exchange 4,500 rupees a day. So if you had more than 4,500 rupees times 60 in savings, remember 80% of... Uh, uh, in uh, India saves in cash and cash and gold, um, then you eliminate, you, you lose your wealth, which was the largest confiscation that we've seen. Um, and, uh, and this is the same thing in Australia. They want to eliminate the 100 Aussie dollar bill in Euro and everywhere around the world, gradually introducing those policies. What that does is, that firstly, you now have traditional national currency. It's got negative interest rates. It's inflationary. Um, it's got the ability for you not to own your money, the ability for the bank to spend it and take systemic risk with your money, a monetary policy that, that guarantees the value goes down, um, a, a financial market which is dying to try and find yield in a market that can't find yield, um, all the reasons why you just would not want to store your value in a national currency. So then you have a few options. You've got gold, you've got fine art, you've got various other things. Um, but then you've also got Bitcoin, which has done the opposite. Um, and the, the final, final piece in this equation is the IMF has their own uh, digital currency called Special Drawing Rights, which is backed by a basket of currencies. Um, and so you will have your choice. You can either take your IMF store of value, which the money supply will increase. It's currently 280 billion. Bitcoin's about 18 billion market cap, so it's still small. Um, but you can guarantee that that's following the same rules in terms of increasing value. So, the end of this has, has, has become that I believe in the future, um, wealthy people are going to determine where they're going to store their assets as a store of value. I believe that as these rules get more and more implemented, they're going to hold as least money as possible in the national currency, and they're only going to hold it uh, the amount of money that they need in order to spend in their economy. Um, the blockchain thing is going to continue to drive more and more people to understand that they don't own their money, that there's a global store of value, um, and there's going to be lots of disintermediation where retail banks are going to try and take investment banks out of the equation, fund managers are going to try and get investment banks out of the equation, retail banks are going to try and take out intermediary payment providers out of the equation, um, and they're all going to be creating, patenting, um, innovating blockchains to make sure that they can do it. But the ones that will succeed will be the ones that are using the only public blockchain that has some scaling issues at the moment, but those scaling issues will be solved in the years, in, in the years to come. And so all of, those, uh, all of those scenarios, I believe, and then you've got central banks raging war on retail banks as well. Uh, take with that <clears throat> what you will. What I find really, really interesting is that sequence of events of what started out as a 20 activists um, in a room trying to achieve something that was completely unthinkable and un impossible has now led to the market that we're in today where global financials, corporates all around the world 
are discussing blockchains, taking the word Bitcoin out of it, but discussing blockchains and driving the, the, the growth and the bull market that we're seeing, which is increasing on sustainable uh, trading volume, increasing volume and increasing transactions. Um, and it all came from that little white paper. Um, and I think the, the next 10 years are going to be 10 of the most interesting years in financial history that we'll see. <clears throat> Pleasure. I take it I've got no time for questions. I talk yeah, through. Yeah, we've got time. Okay. Don't mind. Um, a couple of things. What you're saying is companies are going to be able to use the blockchain to make money. Yeah. Um, what you're saying is companies like banks really are going to get blockchains to cut costs. It's just a, it's just a cost reduction strategy for I think they're looking at blockchains in order to try and figure out who's going to be disintermediated, which is the right thinking. But they're looking, but they're coming to the realization that they're looking at cost savings. Um, but here's my thing, and maybe you know you guys are experts at what you do, and uh, you know what you're doing. But my understanding of the inefficiencies in settlements are not technological problems, but compliance problems. So all of the solutions that I've seen to put uh, registered securities on blockchains introduce a clunky process where they could have their registered security hacked, which can then be reversed by the centralized database. Um, and then they still they, they, they get a time efficiency improvement and then they realize actually we've got to do all the compliance and all the layers in there as well. So they get the same delay. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes next. Thank you. <coughs> um, we have a roving mic at the back of the room there. Um, please, if that's your hands, and quiz uh, Simon Wigglock. We've got a couple of questions, one over here and one over here. Um, can I just get your name and organisation when you ask the question, please? Um, <coughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Great talk. Uh, again, I saw you last night uh, talking in a similar sort of vein in relation to blockchains in general. I guess my question comes, so with, with blockchains in general, and I mean, I take on board exactly the same, the Bitcoin blockchain is incredible technology, as was developed in the original. But there are facets of it that can be signed out. For example, the timestamping of any blockchain is an immune then can create an immutable record. What's the piece of dear nature of a blockchain, notwithstanding that it's Bitcoin blockchain, other blockchain can actually be used. So is it not what you're saying is just a definitional term that from a purist point of view, and I I, I, I would imagine there are a, a Bitcoin through and through from your did that come across? Yeah, it's still vague. But I guess, is it the situation that, okay, maybe the blockchains that the banks are looking at, the are looking at, and some problems in terms of other issues that can be achieved are blockchain based technologies, and it's just a definition of something we're talking about? Uh, maybe. So the, the, the importance is, is that I personally believe that the proof of work and the security behind Bitcoin is something that very, is very unlikely to be ever happen again. You know, kind of like I said, reinventing the internet. <clears throat> you could create a better internet, but trying to get everyone to use it is very hard. Um, but the, pro the point about a blockchain is that you need to reach a certain critical mass um, in order for it to be secure, and Bitcoin's achieved that. So I'd love for a, it'd be great to have competing blockchains, and we've got 3,000 of them, but uh, achieving that critical mass, I think, is gonna be very challenging. That's just a personal opinion. With regards to blockchains and financial institutions, I do think the definition is important. Um, and they did change the word to distributed ledger technology. And I think distributed ledger technology is a more appropriate way of saying we've reignited our interest in databases. Um, and we can now have different parties that all share and download the same databases. Um, but I believe if you actually um, you know, ha had some serious consulting around existing technology that achieves the same results. Um, there's probably existing technology that they just weren't interested in before that could achieve a better result, is my opinion. Thank you for that. We have a question over here. I'll uh, just get the mic over here. Um, thanks very much for that. I could shout. No, no, we've got the mic. Two seconds away. There we go, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a problem from National Hospital. 
straight it back. So one of the organisations that seems to be on the finish line for the day over the next five or ten years. Um, so I don't think of that. I think there will always be a need for fear, but I believe, just, just, just sorry to do that, and then I will take your question. Um, banks are the conduits to fiat um, because they can create it when they issue a loan. Um, at some point, I believe that these attacks are going to create systemic risk and the ability for some of them to go bust. Um, but the, 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 the central bank fiat and the, the normal bank fiat will lead to a reform where, depending on the ratio of debt money versus debt-free national currency, will determine the level of risk within that economy that they want to take. Um, and banks will move more to a peer-to-peer -peer lending model based upon sound money. Um, and that will eliminate a lot of their staff because they won't be able to continue the same operational overhead without creating money every time they issue a loan. But your question. <clears throat> Banking is the way everyone believes it works. Yeah. So, sorry, my question. Yeah. So when the, when the Chinese miners like, stop doing it because proof of work actually doesn't generate enough money because there's only 21 million Bitcoin that are going to be produced, actually what we're talking about is an environment where they're all creative, but nobody would actually want to do any hashing. So nobody can actually approve any transactions. So isn't it at that point that the central banks step into those roles? And the only way that they would ever do that is actually by taking a transaction tax on every single one. So, how, so I think that's actually more of a risk of the system where the central banks actually take over the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, rather than the central banks making their own. As in they, they start mining Bitcoins? The, the central banks start mining Bitcoins? Um, yeah, well, <coughs> there's a point of where you create more Bitcoins, and actually it's not economic for miners to, to continue to do it. Yeah. 12 and a half every 10 minutes now, is it not 12 and a half? Yeah, 12 and a half every 10 minutes. Um, so, I mean, that's why transaction fees are increasing at the moment, and that's why Bitcoin is becoming not so good a currency and a much better store of value, because the more the price goes up, the more people use it, the tra transaction fees become a more and more important role in compensating the miners um, who are verifying the transactions. And so by 2140, when all the Bitcoins have been created, um, we, you know, I, I can't exactly forecast exactly where this is going to go, but what I do know is in the six to seven years I've been watching this, we've seen um, an extremely efficient market whereby the difficulty rate of mining Bitcoin adjusts depending on the price um, and uh, more and more efficiency is required in order to, to get that. And then transaction volume is starting to become more and more of a play as the mining revenues are starting to diminish. And just a really efficient market. And I don't know, it, it's not that, in my opinion, it's not that Satoshi Nakamoto knew all this. It's just he created the rules, and the rules have been figured out by the, the natural market capitalist forces. Um, so, what happens when central banks start um, mining? Well, the idea behind a, a, you know, a censorship resistance um, store of value where anyone can mine and anyone can participate is that you might get um, central banks and you might get governments investing significant resource um, for the, the, the Bitcoin mining, um, but they won't be able to change the code because miners don't control everything. So there's an ecosystem. The economy that's kind of emerged at the moment is the developments happening in America. The mining's mainly happening in China. There's distribution around that. A lot of the speculation is happening in Japan and China. Um, and really, we've got this kind of force. So if you were, at, we, we were at Cancun, where all of the CEOs um, of all the Bitcoin companies and the developers were around the table, heated debate about these things, you know, scaling, what's going to happen next. Um, and what you find is that, that nobody actually, even if you have significant mining power, you still can't persuade the other parties into this. So it's kind of like uh, the system we have right now with America and China, where China is heavily invested in US treasuries, um, and they're heavily invested in their export market. So even though they'd love to eliminate the US dollar and be the world reserve currency, they've also got to protect their investment, their export markets, and their treasury investments. And so you have to have this kind of you know, working relationship. And I think a similar thing um, will evolve here. And, but yeah, you, you bring up interesting points. No one knows where these things are actually going to go. But all I know is that it will, even if they do, 
um, they won't be able to implement some kind of transaction tax um, because it's not just miners that control the network. You've got to get consensus in for all the parties. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, um, while there is transparency, there's anonymity to the user. And anonymity is a very important uh, feature set of a blockchain. Um, if you introduce KYC and identities um, to a blockchain, then you ruin the security of the model. So this is another example where regulators, is money laundering more important or is consumer protection more important? Well, at the moment, regulators are choosing money laundering because if they were thinking of consumer protection, they wouldn't ask everyone to subject themselves to identity theft and risk emailing identities, uploading it to Google's server, a company's server, Apple's server, um, and then they're being sold on the Silk Road for Bitcoins. Um, if they were thinking of consumer protection, they wouldn't subject people to that. So they're choosing money laundering over consumer protection. That's a deliberate decision uh, that's been made about what's important. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the, the, the anonymity is a very important security feature. Um, and I believe Bitcoins over time will become more and more fungible um, and more and more things will be implemented to give people the choice of privacy or ultra transparency. Um, and, but yes, I do believe that uh, the NSA has invested significant resource in being able to reverse engineer a blockchain and I believe tax authorities all around the world are investing significant resource. Um, uh, but remember, you have a choice here. You either use centralized um, systems, exchanges, which are subject to regulations and everything else, or you use the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and the challenge comes in jurisdiction. So if someone tries to claim jurisdiction over it, then all the companies move to the jurisdiction that wants to create all the blockchain jobs. Um, and the banking system that's going to support them. And so at this point, competing jurisdictions have become really, really important in maintaining the integrity of this because while, um, you know, if America wants to, wants to clamp down, then it will just drive everything to another jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, with a, with a global asset class, you're just looking for your base there. So uh, what was the second part? Yeah. Yeah, so to me, uh, a blockchain is useful when you want to take that asset class and you want to turn it into a bearer instrument that the user can own. <clears throat> and then you want to disintermediate a counterparty in order for two people to transact without that counterparty. That's where a blockchain comes in useful. Distributed ledger technology doesn't need any of that. It's just a bunch of parties that are deciding that they're all going to download a copy um, and trust each other and then they can audit it because if one doesn't match the other, um, these are two, in my opinion, very different things. Awesome. But that's been fantastic food for thought. I hope everyone's brains are just exploding with uh, more questions and more ideas. But we are challenged by time, so I'm sorry, Simon, we've, we've got a couple of questions there. Uh, would you 